Good day and welcome back to the 40 Orty Podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley. Of course, today we are covering a very, very interesting episode for our second episode of season three. We're going to be talking about martial arts. We're going to be talking particularly about Al Loren's experiences with martial arts, how he came to teach um, autistic and disabled individuals, how martial arts can benefit disabled and autistic individuals, as well as the importance of finding a balance between challenging ourselves or challenging other people, but also taking into account people's needs and individual adjustments. So I think it's going to be a really good <clears throat> podcast. If you have been a part of the channel for a while, you'll know that I'm very into the martial arts world. And I'm very honored to be joined by my guest today, Al Loren. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Thomas. It's uh, wonderful to be here. And uh, Where are I'm you tuning in from? I am tuning in from Marin County, California, which is the first county north of uh, San Francisco, right over the Golden Gate Bridge. Whereabouts in the, in the U.S. is that like, If looking at like the map, is it like the, the top or the middle or like? Because it's, it's, it's hard for me to know because the okay. UK is so it, small. It, <laughs> it, it, it's the west coast of the of the United States, California, mm -hmm. and it's Northern California. So Los Angeles is about uh, oh, three to four hundred miles south of San Francisco, and uh, I'm in the northern area of uh, a big state, California, which is bigger than most uh, countries in the world. Wow. Well. Yeah, it probably probably a lot bigger than the UK, that's for sure. Oh, it, it is. California has one of the uh, top 10 largest economies, even though it's a, a state within the United States in, in the world. So really? it's got a huge econ economy, large population. Yeah. Is it quite is it quite temperate out there, like warm? Because in the UK at the moment, it is. I mean, it's it's a bit weird. It's kind of bone chilling most days, but. Like now and again, we'll have kind of a mildly temperate day, but not, nothing compared to like other places in the world where it's like sunny and warm. Like when I used to live in Thailand, it was, I think the lowest that it got was about 14 degrees Celsius, which is, you know, pretty, pretty, like it's like it's good weather in the UK that, <laughs> you know. Well, um, we're here today to talk about martial arts. And as I mentioned earlier, like I've, I've had my own sort of history uh, within the martial arts world, I used to compete for Great Britain a couple of times in the sport of Taekwondo, WTF Taekwondo, I think it's WF now, they've kind of changed it, or WT, which is basically like boxing and we wear like all sorts of different pieces of equipment and stuff and it's very much like a point scoring game, uh, it's full contact. But I, I was a part of that world for a long time, since about the age of 14, um, up until kind of 19, my university days. And um, I've had a lot of experiences, both like traveling abroad, you know, competing and such. And it would be really, I suppose, good for me to, to hear about your experiences, because I know that you've been sort of in the world of martial arts for over 30 years. I'd, li I'd like to perhaps start with your kind of own experience like when when did you start and what what kind of journey did you go on getting to the point where you, where you started coaching when i was growing up and i'm quite a bit older than you <laughs> uh, uh, martial arts was not the uh, household wor word it was mostly organized sports and it wasn't really as nearly as readily available as it is today or it has been in the past 20 to 25 years as I grew up in the um, 60s and 70s. And so I was in college as in my university, which is American University, which is in Washington, D.C., where I got my degree and attended for four years. And my senior year at American University, I, uh, uh, my final semester, I needed an extra, I, I would say credit or, uh, something because I'd completed all my 
credits for my major and I had to uh, take another credit to uh, to graduate. And I saw that they were offering, as you said, Taekwondo. And I'd always, you know, had watched uh, a lot of martial arts movies, the Chinese movies that were dubbed in back in the 60s and um, kind of triggered my interest. I've always been involved in organized sports. I've played sports since uh, since day one, out of the womb, pretty much. Um, American sports. I played football. I played organized basketball. Um, I played uh, baseball, of course. And then I got heavily into the sport of lacrosse, which I played in college. And so I'd always been interested in discipline and movement and uh, just learning how to move my body in uh, different ways. And so when I saw that they had martial arts, they were offering a Taekwondo course. I said, I'll sign up for that. I need the credit anyway to graduate. And uh, that was my first exposure. So I was probably, you know, 20 years old, 21 years old when I first got involved in it. I, it, it like I said, it wasn't really available like it is now to a, a, as a child, as a kid. And so it really, I really enjoyed it. I graduated. I moved from Washington, D.C., where the American University was, to Florida. The, a couple months went by, and then I uh, I noticed I was living in a uh, an apartment complex, and my neighbor next door to me was uh, teaching out of his apartment. I saw some people come out with uniforms with the geese on. And I go, hmm, that's interesting. So I went it's over and approached <laughs> Yeah, I over, went over and approached him. I mean, he just had a small little group going on because it was in his in his apartment. And I asked him, I said, would he uh, be willing to take on another student? And, uh, you know, he kind of interviewed me and uh, we came to an agreement. And that's where my more serious training started. Well, anyway, long story short, he after I trained with him for probably in a small group, uh, an Okinawan style called Shuriru, and it's a karate style. And he was very, very much into um, into the lifestyle of martial arts. And he had a girlfriend that was from uh, Indonesia, and she had set up a a training. I guess she had certain connections. Set up a training with um, with the Buddhist temples up in the mountains of Indonesia, which. Um, he was going to go there and uh, and live for a while and train. So he said, he said to me, "You better go find a dojo because I'm not going to be able to teach you anymore." So I found a dojo in in Florida, in Miami, uh, where I was living, Greater Miami, which is a, a big city in uh, in the United States and a, and one of the biggest cities in uh, in Florida. Found a a place called Miami Karate Academy. Started training there really getting into it seriously, the lifestyle, the training, the discipline, and it just became a part of me. And as I got into my mid-20s and got away from playing organized sports because they were school-oriented sports and I was out of school, I had graduated, this really filled that that area that I needed to mm -hmm. be filled for my body movement, my competing, but there was so much more. I enjoyed the discipline. I enjoyed the camaraderie of training with other people. Then I got into competing, like you said, into tournaments. And I've competed in quite a few tournaments, everything from local, state, world championships, United States Open, doing kata, uh, fighting, and uh, weaponry. Kata is like the movements, isn't it? Like the, we call it pat patterns, I think, in in the dojo that I was at, but okay. I think it's interesting that you were sort of mentioning about like an Okinawan style because I've very much been into like a particular sort of string of movies called like The Karate Kid. Um, not, right. not like the new one with like Jaden Smith, like the old one, like kind of Daniel LaRusso kind of, I've, I've probably watched like the series of Karate Kid movies over like at least like 40 50 times like i had a such an obsession with like particularly around like asian culture and i think you know obviously when when we're talking about martial arts you know a lot of people kind of nowadays you see things like the ufc sort of mma you see like obviously taekwondo you see boxing you see like muay thai sort of championships 
which is all very much like focused on sort of the physical discipline of like fighting and competition and stuff. But, you know, as you said, there is quite a large sort of cultural discipline, sort of mental or even social aspect to, to martial arts, which I don't think it's, I don't think it's really highlighted a lot sort of in, in our sort of modern day, but I think it was, you know, it was, it was quite interesting, particularly for me to kind of learn around like the backgrounds of it. And, you know, I lived, I lived in Thailand and, um, I was around some, some monks, which who, who like practiced and did like shows and stuff for the, like the tourists and all that. So it, it is, it is interesting kind of like the roots of it. Have you seen the Karate Kid films? I was blown away by the original Karate Kid movie. Mm. After that, I watched a little bit of the <laughs> sequels and it was a, a, a bit diluted for me, you know, but yes. the first one, quite honestly, <laughs> it, it made me cry. It, yes. it really moved, it, literally, it, it really moved me. And, you know, it's, um, you know, I know it's some Hollywood and all that, but uh, mm. it, it really, it really hit a note in, in, in my inner being. And um, I thought it was, it was pretty for the time, you know, the early eighties was pretty fantastic in, in mm. a lot of ways and gave the martial arts um, some great exposure universally, you know, really yeah. started to, uh, to put it out there. And uh, Cause Mr. Miyagi is like, cause when, when you were talking about like, the individual that you sort of trained in their apartment is kind of making me, you mentioned Okinawa as well. So I was like trying to thinking of like Mr. Miyagi sort of doing his, his classes with <laughs> sort of Daniel in like the, you know, um, trimming bonsai trees and catching flies with chopsticks and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah so it, it, I think it really opened a big door for um, the public here certainly in the mm -hmm. States to really enthusiastically get a lot more uh, awareness and interest in, in the martial arts. It, it was, um, it was kind of a watershed moment. I would say that movie coming out and the uh, exposure it got for martial arts. I suppose arts. talking about like sort of the, what do you say? The, the, the sort of epitome of the, the movie sort of like the final fights between well, how is it? It's, it's Daniel and I can't remember the name of the dude, the guy from Co Cobra Kai. I've watched it so many times, I still can't remember his name. <laughs> but um, I suppose sort of leading on from like that that ep epitome of that movie. I mean, what is one of the more memorable sort of competitions or, or fights that you've had, which were like particularly like difficult or emotional or sort of had a had sort of the most impact on you well you know, I, competing one year in the world championships and we're talking probably the mid 80s and uh, we were in an arena and there were practitioners from all over the world and uh, i was getting ready to fight and i was feeling really I believe I was a, um, a brown belt at the time. And um, so I was fighting in the brown belt division, which is pretty intense division because everybody's hungry to move to the next level. And uh, when you're competing against not only people from your own country, but from South America and Europe and on and on, I'd really trained hard for that. And uh, I was feeling really good about myself. And yeah, uh, I had some fans there who were going to watch me in my next match. And uh, my girlfriend at the time was there. And uh, I was just feeling very, very confident that I was uh, going to be successful in that fight. And I was fighting against a, um, <laughs> my match was against a Taekwondo practitioner, as a matter of fact. And, um, Interesting. So, you know, I know Taekwondo has really good, kicking and legs. I knew that. And I figured if I could get inside the legs that I would be really successful and uh, had a, had a good chance at being winning, winning the match. Well, 
what happened was uh, I did not get inside the legs. I got kicked in the <laughs> <laughs> I got kicked to the head and uh, really hard, and you know, mm-hmm. got my bell rung. Was a little was was pretty uh, physically dizzy after that, and ended mm-hmm. up losing the fight. And kind of, you know, learned a lesson there to never really um, lost the fight, actually. I'm uh, not proud to say, but being honest and um, humble to say that at that at that time, uh, you know, the Taekwondo uh, pra- practitioner was uh, was more efficient than I was. And so that that's a that's a story that, you know really stuck with me because I realized uh, I was probably a little uh, overconfident and to, um, to, you know, had to temper that part of myself and just to, uh, to, to, for future experiences, know that, know that, you know, confidence is good. However, um, you know, I have to be there in the moment and uh, realize that uh, on any given moment, anything is possible and uh, just take it as it comes from that perspective. I think um, it's really interesting to kind of hear hear a story. Like when I first started going around uh, the international circuit, because of my height, I was about six foot three when I started. I mean, I still am. (laughs) <laughs> but I was pre- I was pretty tall so then and so I was in quite a heavy sort of weight division and one thing about weight class sports is that like the majority of people tend to sit like in the middle of that weight class so there's a lot of people who compete in the, the sort of middle divisions but not many people sort of on the the upper end of things so I tended not to have too many fights to kind of get through to make it to the finals but because I was so so it's usually ordered and, and seeded based on how many like ranking points you have as a fighter. So if you just join as kind of a beginner and you have very little ranking points, you tend to be put with people who are very, very good at the start, basically. Because uh, they try and have them on like both sides of the sort of um the table as as people sort of move and fight to the kind of the middle to the finals. And I had this fight, I think, with like, and and at that time he was probably like number number one seeded in the world for my weight class, which was a bit daunting, considering it was probably like my second international fight. And I remember, I remember giving it a good go. <laughs> like, <laughs> I definitely wasn't, I wasn't uh, quite at his level. That is, that is for sure. I remember this because I've always particularly being quite a sort of aggressive fighter. I've been, I was, I was kind of a nervy fighter. Like I had a lot of like panic attacks and meltdowns and stuff before fights or like coming up to the actual sort of event. Um, but I always did it. And when I was actually sort of in the fight, it was very, I was very sort of forward front footed kind of fighter. And, you know, obviously this, this guy just delivered, I think one of the most, the hardest back kick that I've ever experienced in my life, which is like the, I don't know, like it, like kind of like a horse kick. I don't know if there's like a different name and that you that you know of, but he he just absolutely plowed his foot into my into my body, and I had body armor on, but it completely winded me, and um, I th- I think that was probably like one of the more memorable ones for me. The other the other sort of memorable competition would be sort of the the commonwealth which is like a sort of collection of countries who come to fight or come to compete together it's quite a well-known thing sort of in in the uk um i don't think it's a us thing though but um i had to fight i think well there's a three other australians in my category and i was in the category below heavyweights and there was one guy in heavyweights so they decided to merge the light heavyweights myself with the heavyweights. So I ended up kind of like in the final in this very sort of Rocky esque kind of movie moments with like the crowd just like shouting because it was like the final fight of the day as well because because of our weight division. And it was a very, very, very sort of crazy experience. I have talked about it before, so I won't I won't go into too much detail on it, but 
no, it's, it's, it's really good to hear sort of your your experience as well. I'm always it's always kind of enlightening to to hear other people's journey through martial arts. But I suppose focusing a little bit more on like the the topic of the podcast, which mm-hmm. is it's kind of around martial arts and autism. At what what point did you decide that to start coaching, and why was it that you sort of gravitated towards teaching autistic and disabled individuals? Okay. It was about 1991 when I, it was actually 1991 when I started teaching. I was in the corporate world for employment and, um, you know, I was earning a nice living and, uh, but, and still training. Uh, when I moved out to San Francisco area, the Bay, what we call the Bay Area of California, um, is a very rich area for martial arts when I moved from mm-hmm. Miami, Florida there in 1989. So I wanted to c- continue my training, which I had been doing in Florida uh, for probably, uh, oh, since I moved there for uh, 10 to 12 years. Uh, and I wanted to continue. And I, I was excited when I moved out here because uh, out to California and to the Bay Area because of the really rich uh, – area of martial arts where there was a lot going on there. And so um, I continued training. I got into different styles when I moved here in 89, 1989, um, karate. I got into some Wing Chun Kung Fu, got into some Aikido, Jiu Jitsu, Tai Chi, and um, just continued on to learn new things. And um, I guess you could say I was kind of on a mission to just to, to better myself uh, martial arts wise, internally, discipline wise. And, and I really enjoyed it. It was my passion. It was my spiritual mm-hmm. uh, calling, so to speak. Yeah. And it just felt a big part of me. Well, I met a man and, you know, we got talking and um, just in, in, in passing kind of randomly, so to speak. And I told him what I did. I said, I'm in the corporate world, corporate advertising. I'm not really that happy. I said, I'm making a good living, but it's not really sustaining me internally. And mm-hmm. it's not where my passion is, my my calling, my heart doesn't sing from that. And he said, you know, and I told him about my martial arts background. And he said to me, he goes, you know, you should consider teaching. And I, I looked at him and I, with a funny expression on my face, I said, me teach? I go, he goes, yeah, you may not feel like a uh, teacher, but you know more than most. And I started to ponder that. And my coaches were the same. They were like, Thomas, you should get into teaching. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I would like to. I would like to. But... <laughs> and, 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 you know, I, I really slept on it for a while. And I go, you know, if I don't make a move and do something now, I'm not happy doing what I'm doing in my career. I'm never going to do it. So what I started to do is I, um, I started to advertise. It was before the internet, really. And uh, in late mid to late 1990, and uh, I was dating this woman by the name of Jennifer, who eventually came, became my wife. And we would go out on dates. And on a Saturday night, we would go out to dinner, and then we would post flyers of classes that I found a studio where I could teach at uh, mm-hmm. in my area and that I was leasing space from. And I'd post flyers of uh, my classes and, um, you know, one free class. If you try, if you come and see me and uh, I actually got a lot of business from that. I started doing demonstrations at different local centers, recreation centers, schools, and um, I, little by little, started to develop a clientele and a reputation. Mm-hmm. Um, there were only, a, in my county where I live, there were only a few schools, a few dojos back then. Yeah. Now there's probably <laughs> 40 to 50. There were probably like, you could count them on one or two hands, uh, mostly on one hand, when I first started, which was fortunate for me. 
And, uh, you know, the Ninja Turtles were were big at the time. And so <laughs> there was a lot of interest from kids. And I kind of built my business around kids at the time, although I also started teaching Tai Chi to um, adults and seniors about the same time. At, um, I, I did a lot of work at retirement residences, which I'm still at 33 yeah. years later th- uh, for seniors, the Tai Chi. I've heard that the, the Tai Chi can be quite quite a good sort of exercise for for, for older people. Yes, very good for the balance. It's it's not impactful on the body. It's something they can do because it's slow moving so they can be delivered, deliberate and take their time and feel what they're doing so it's safe for them. Yeah, absolutely. Tai Chi is probably the best exercise for seniors. And when I'm talking seniors in my class, I have a woman last week at one of my uh, facilities that I teach at re- residences. She just turned 107. So, (laughs) you know, it goes all the way. My median age is probably 85 to 90 in a lot of my places where I teach at. I'm in about seven or eight different places that I teach at uh, Monday through Friday. Tai Chi, that is in addition to all my other martial arts schools and Mm. um, clients. Taekwondo might be, Taekwondo might be a bit too, um, too intense too. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> so uh, okay, yeah, do a roundhouse yeah. kick. Like <laughs> no, no, no spinning back heel kicks no, or no, front no. jump kicks. That's not no. that's not happening. <laughs> so anyway, back to my story. Uh, in 1991, I decided to go full time, and you know I was getting uh, I was getting a pretty good crop of students, and so I um, I was working at my corporate job and teaching in the afternoons. Uh, doing the same until it was enough to sustain me. Uh, for about six months, I was had two jobs, and then I let go of my corporate work, my um, advertising that I was in, and uh, went full time, and I never looked back since. So I've been full time, uh, uh, self employed, teaching hmm. Tai Chi and martial arts for. Let's see, I started January of 1991, and it's February of 2000. So. 33 years and doing well, it full time and earning when, a living at it. So, um, and what spent, about when, so if you, you had your first kind of autistic or, or sort of disabled student, like when is it that you made like the switch to sort of focusing on teaching that kind of demographic of people? Well, what I wouldn't your say, I, yeah, I wouldn't say it was a switch. It was a very, um, profound addition to my training, to my teachings. Mm. And it was about 1992. And actually a mom, or as you would say in England, a mom, we say Mm. M-O-M, you say (laughs) M-U-M. I watched a lot of uh, Brit box movies, which which I'm kind of tired of the American movies sometimes. I'm really enjoying (laughs) that. It's opened up a whole new world for me. But anyway, getting back to the point, a mom of a kid who I was teaching was an occupational therapist. And she called me up one day and she said, this is about, yeah, about 1992. Um, she said, would you, she said, Al, would you be interested in teaching two boys who have, um, I don't even think she's, the word autism was not even the buzz back then, you know, 32 yes. years yeah. ago and who have some, maybe she said disabilities, some physical mm-hmm emotional disabilities. Would you be interested in working with them privately together? And I said, absolutely. And so that was my first um, first experience of teaching in that area. And I go, hmm, I said to myself, this is pretty cool. I really connect with them. I resonate with them. I feel them. And I like, like working with them because I can see the vast, great vet benefits of doing martial arts, you know, for their mm. their coordination, their fine and gross motor skills, their amen- emotional makeup, and how they can gain some self confidence and mm. some environmental and space spatial awareness around them, and just using their bodies better and feeling more confident. And I also noticed that I really wanted to. Um, Make it fun for them to have the, to have joy when they were were doing it, and I seem to be pretty good at it. And you know, I go back to my family roots, and my dad was really good with kids. He was a pediatrician, a practicing doctor, physician, 
and he, you know, his, his practice was working, you know, treating kids. And so I probably inherently got some of that energy from him, that ability. So I, yeah, I just yeah. seem to naturally normally connect with people who had, you know, who have now what we say, who are on the spectrum and non non-divergent and disability, whatever you want to call it, you know, mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. here, you know, politically correct and politically maybe incorrect, <laughs> but you know, people who could use some help. And, um, I just seem to really like a, like a whisperer connect with them. And so I started to little by little from that point on seek out those associations and groups and uh, schools that uh, work with with that type of demographic. Well, in, in terms of like, I suppose, perhaps like specifically like autistic people, were there right. any like sort of standout kind of highlights, sort of either, either like learning moments for you or um, sort of successful moments for you or kind of like times, times which you kind of approach and perception sort of shifted? Well, I had one student who had autism that I was working with privately. And this is probably about oh, 10 to 15 years ago. And he told me, he goes, somehow we got into a conversation while we were doing our training session. And he said to me, he looked at me and he, got, he called me Sensei. And he said, Sensei Al, you know something? You're the only person that I respect on this planet. And I looked at him and I go, okay, wow. And I thought about that and I'm going like, wow. You know, it stuck with me for quite, it still sticks with me quite a bit after that. Here's somebody, somebody who's telling me, making a statement like that, that I'm the only person that he respects. Now, granted he has autism, but, and he struggled, you know, academically, um, and he struggled uh, relationship wise and finding his place in the world and what he wants to do and his mission and everything. But, you know, he was very capable, really good, a very good martial artist and got a lot of power and was pretty well coordinated. Um, but what he said to me that he, I was the only person on the planet that he respected, I'm going like, oh my goodness, that's like a tremendous, impactful statement that. It, really moving me. And, you know, I was honored. I was um, just completely blown away that he would, would say that to me. I mean, yeah, I've given him my best teaching effort and I'm there to help him. But for someone to say something like that, that, that was an incredible moment for me. But there's been, you know, that's one that, you know, just off the top of my head that was impactful. But there's so many, you know, I have autistic students who I've promoted to black belt which I never thought would happen, occur, that what came up through the ranks who have done, you know, years of training. I have a student who's a black belt of mine. And in fact, the original student that I was uh, mentioning, referring to earlier, one of the two boys that I, that got me started, the referral from the, uh, from the mom that I was uh, teaching their son, he's still with me 30 years later. And he's mm -hmm. one of my black belts. His name is John. And I see him privately and work with him once a week pretty much for the last 30 years. And, you know, it's amazing to have students that long standing. He's like a family member. He's like a, yes. you know, a yeah. surrogate son to me. And, yeah. uh, you know, I know him so well. And it does kind of feel like a family system. Like when, yeah. once you, you kind of have like, you know, sort of people within sort of the, the training halls and stuff. That's what, that's why you can get like so much drama. Like when, people move from like classes to like other people or like, <laughs> you know, they sort of decide to go, to go somewhere else. There can be sometimes a bit of sort of political kind of drama, at least as, as far as I, I've seen and heard of sort of in the Taekwondo world. This, how you define success with autism is different than mainstream success to me. And when I see the kids or teens, and I work with kids, young kids, teens, adults. Like I said, my student who's been with me for 30 years, he's going to be turning 40 in July, this year in July. So, you know, up to that, up to that age, I have another girl 
or a woman now uh, who has autism, who's been working with me for 20 years. She started with me when she was 16 and she's 36 now that I work with privately. And she's also a black belt, and very capable and a really good martial artist and can defend herself. Knows how to take care of herself. If anybody tries to grab her, she's got a great, great blocking system, defense system. She kicks well. She's spot on with her techniques. She knows submission moves, tech takedowns. So my motto is never underestimate what a person is capable of when you present it to them. It may not be easy for them. It may take patience, diligence, time, and uh, um, just a lot of commitment and effort. But I'm always one to say in the world of autism and also other disabilities, present and give the person the opportunity. And they many times, you know, they're not going to take off like a, you know, a ballerina always, but they're going to rise to the occasion. And from what I found from my experience that they want to do well. And once they see little, little bits of success and encouragement from the right teacher, the right sensei or the right teacher in any area, they're going to, they're going to start to believe in themselves, get more self-confidence and um, see those little steps of success going in the right direction. And no matter how incremental or how small they may be, it's definitely um, achievable and tangible. I see a um, a lot of commitment, a lot of progress, and willingness through encouragement to want to participate. And, you know, I've gotten years and tons of resistance over the years. And sometimes it takes quite a period of time to uh, to break the ice, so to speak. And some of my best martial artists on the spectrum had been very resistant and hesitant initially. Sometimes it might take a week, a month, or even longer, six like months before thing, they want to dive into it. But I stick with it and encourage them. And then all of a sudden, you know, little by little, it can happen and they can become, they can just soar. I get quite a few that go, whoa, this is pretty cool. And I can actually do this. And look, there's somebody here who's willing to teach me. And, and, and then the whole group rallies around each other. So it's really good for social socialization. You know, they're encouraging, way to go, whoever the person's name is, way to go, Lily, way to go, Stephen, way to go, who, you know, James. And, and they encourage each other and they feed off of each other and they clap for each other. And that's just really amazing. And it really means it's wholeheartedly means a lot to each individual to be encouraged and to go, wow, I must be doing pretty well here. I want to continue with this. And it's, it just, you know, evolves from there in a really powerful and positive way. I've been attacked. I've been scratched. I've been cursed at. I've been, um, you know, had so many disruptions in my class. So, you know, there's that end too. So that's where my ability to be patient and loving and compassion and understanding and forgiveness comes in. And for an effective teacher, whether it's martial arts or any teacher with working on the spectrum and teaching on the spectrum, you really sincerely need those qualities. You can't, it's not just a job. It's, it's a way of being. And, you know, for me, it's my passion. It's become my passion. I love it. I care. I uh, believe in my students. I believe in what I'm doing. And, um, you know, now after 33 years, I have reference points of success for, um, for those characteristics of knowing that the, uh, the students are going to accomplish things and they really develop a, a sense of purpose and self-accomplishment. Well, I'm, I suppose it'd be good to kind of talk about, I suppose, some of like the benefits of, you know, martial arts. I think from my personal experience, I definitely learned a lot of interpersonal kind of social skills through my experiences. Because I, I was never really, I, I did become a coach at one point, but I was kind of one of the sort of the the top sort of people in the 
the in terms of training, in terms of like belt structure and in terms of like success and such. And I had a lot of around that time I wasn't the most sort of social myself. I I definitely found that through my um experiences, you know, part of the martial arts world that and I started to kind of develop sort of a, a feeling of, of being a part of a group or a family uh, around the time that I was sort of competing quite regularly and I was training quite regularly. You know, I was in secondary school and for for a lot of autistic people, secondary school or high school can be particularly difficult. And so it was kind of like my, some, somewhat like my escape and it was also called me anxiety sometimes, but it was i think it was generally quite good for me in that way and as i sort of moved through and sort of got myself more accustomed to the environment i definitely took on quite a lot of sort of leadership roles in those in those areas i think you were saying before about sort of your one of one of your parents and how sort of their influence kind of sort of fed into your your sort of coaching and my mum's the same. I mean, she's like an autism, one of like the lead autism heads, or she was for a large part of England. And um, I definitely, that kind of stuff rubs off on you, I think. I think there's there's also something to be said about like the nature of like martial arts or, or doing sports or training. You know, obviously having quite a stable routine is important for autistic people. And it's it's funnily enough, like one of the, I would say one of the, the more interesting kind of like benefits of of go, being autistic kind of in martial arts that kind of sticking to routine and hyper focus and such i think probably the 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 major sort of benefit that i could you know talk on which you know is is was kind of related to my experience in secondary school which was kind of like you know sort of navigating confrontation bullying and such um i had a really hard time with that particularly particularly in secondary school um, a lot of instances of both sort of physical social and emotional bullying i never particularly used like my skills in that fashion but when i when i started to get to quite a high level in the sport started to make like the school newspaper and you know be have my face sort of posted throughout the school uh, people started to kind of not pick on me as much, which was kind of good. Uh, absolutely. And one one of, you know, that 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 was definitely a really big benefit for me because my self esteem was was pretty much rock bottom for uh, a very very long time, and that kind of showed me sort of the benefits of having a bit of grit, a bit of sort of self perseverance, even even if things are very difficult, um, how how that can be beneficial. Also, like stepping stepping outside of my comfort zone is also, I think, something that you know it is definitely something that I did in the martial arts world. But also, you know, those experiences sort of carried on sort of throughout my life, whether it be going to university, living on my own, whether it be going abroad, going backpacking. You know, I've I've always been. My mum's always had this very sort of great attitude towards me which is kind of like pushing me to step outside of my comfort zone but always you know feeling okay about sort of retreating and sort of feeling kind of comfortable so that those those are kind of like the top things that 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 come to mind when i you know think about sort of the impact of like martial arts on on my life is there anything that you'd like you'd like to add particularly about sort of the experiences with your students? Absolutely, Thomas. I think that you mentioned some really great points. Self-esteem, enhancement, self-confidence, sense of self-accomplishment. And um, what I mean by that is you know, uh, a student of mine, uh, either specifically or in general, learning a technique that they're having difficulty with. And over mm-hmm. a period of time, they say, for instance, a roundhouse kick or a, um, 
you know, doing an effective uppercut or how to get out of a wrist grab or a shirt grab. And they, they at first are, are not really interpreting that physically, mentally, physically. And when they, over a period of time practicing, and they go, oh, I got it. Look at that. Oh, yes. And they get a sense of confidence and self achievement, self accomplishment, which is awesome because, you know, being on the spectrum, they are not always witnessing that or experiencing that. So well, that's a I think really there is a pretty, pretty sort of strong, strong sort of trend that I've seen in, in some, in some parents, not all parents, but you know, you might, you might, it's something that I've heard from my mom some, sometimes like, or I've, I've seen even myself and, and heard from other sort of autistic adults that, you know, sometimes people kind of, yeah, I think maybe coddle might be the right, the right word, sort of try and protect us too much from sort of going out and doing things or, or telling us that we can't do specific things because of, you know, being autistic. I think, you know, I, th I think definitely like that there is a line and it's obviously going to, where that line is, where the, where the goals that we set for the individual is, is very dependent on like who that person is and what their capabilities are. And I agree. I totally agree. I mean, if you want to raise the person, raise their capabilities, you must raise the bar. Mm. It's just, you know, and, you know, the going to mainstream and then bringing it synonymous with autism on the spectrum, the greatest inventors, the greatest achievers were not afraid to fail. Mm. Failure was a, a roadmap for their success. They find out what works and what doesn't work. And in the world of autism, if you don't present it to them, they're never, we're never going to know. They're never going to know. They're never going to have the opportunity to, to as you used a really good word earlier, uh, develop that grit, that internal mm. grit to be able to push through things. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not, sometimes it's not an easy world for, for anybody. And certainly for people on the spectrum, there, it has its life challenges. So when you present and allow them to grow and give them new things to work at and develop, um, it's doing them a great service. Mm -hmm. And I, they may be hesitant, not confident, but what you said, another great word that you use or a point that you said, you know, when you coddle them too much, you, you know, you, you, you don't, you don't have any evolution or growth. And I know some people, you know, it depends on the individual. Every person is different and they proceed and operate and interact with the world differently. And I get that. And some people, you know, have different, everybody has different considerations, hmm. but well, I, I'm, I'm one for pushing people to, uh, I'm, I'm one to raise the bar. Well, I think it's, it's definitely an, an interesting kind of sort of line of thinking. I think everyone deviates with their own personal experiences and like, you know, if I, if I put out like a post particularly about, you know, saying, saying, you know, don't let the fact that you're autistic stop you from doing the things that you want to do. Um, I get very, very mixed reactions. Some people are like, oh yeah, you're right. You know, I can do this. And they take it quite positively. Other people, they kind of, you know, say, well, actually, you know, I'm disabled and this is difficult for me. And, and, you know, you're not really taking into consideration that people can have all sorts of different reactions when you like kind of <laughs> speak on, you know, de developing that grit and everyone falls somewhere on, on the spectrum. But I think it's very worthwhile to try and, I suppose, understand, well, I mean, understand like the, me the mentality that's, that's kind of important. Cause I do think that there is a, a pretty sort of key like middle ground to it. I don't, I don't think that we should be stopped from, from doing certain things. I think there is definitely a lot of utility in, um, doing things differently and providing adjustments and also being a bit more cautious, a bit more sensitive around new experiences, new things. 
But I definitely don't think it should it should be something that we should stop, you know, autistic people from engaging with just because they can find it quite quite difficult. I think, you know, there's a lot of learning to be done in sort of finding sort of new challenges for people to, to sort of confront. Agreed. But I suppose like it'd be good to to know like in your in your personal experience, like what what sort of mentality do you do you sort of try to instill within your autistic students when it when it comes to facing sort of challenges and difficulties that they may have? Yeah. I really emphasize that um, with my students, especially my private students and my class students, that with a with some effort and time and um, time commitment to our practices, you will get better. You will achieve learning of some of the techniques that they're the only perfection is the effort and uh, the willingness to move towards doing something to the best of your ability to increasing your 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 effort and with my teaching or as you would say i guess maybe they say in england coaching we call it teaching here but to, either yeah. way i provide encouragement lots of patience sincere compassion when need to be and uh, try to make it as a joyful and fun experience as possible um, does it work for everybody like you said you know there's some middle ground there that you know it's it, there's not one very straight individual. linear formula that you can mm -hmm. apply to each each individual is different and 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 I will tell a parent or a school or a teacher if it's not working for that student at that time it, it's you know it, we're not getting the benefit that we're looking for it's just discouraging them and I'll let them know but most mm -hmm. of the time percentage times I see that the martial arts are, are just, ben, you know, can be of great benefit. And when I mean great benefit, you know, they're not going to jump around throwing spinning, you know, jumping, spinning back heel kicks or anything like that. I mean, just from a standpoint that they're getting exercise, that their mind is mm -hmm. working, their concentration is developing. They're following me in a very specific way because we're working one-on-one -on -one and I can keep all the focus on them and they can keep some focus on me. So the, the thoughts are getting stronger. The processing in the brain is getting stronger. They're getting more used to moving their body. They're developing reflexes, flexibility, coordination, as I said earlier, uh, gross and mm. fine motor skills. Yeah. Their reflexes are getting better and they're having fun and they're they're getting some joy out of it. So I, I, those are the experiences that I am looking to instill in my students and that I see manifesting. And the reason I wrote my book is to tell of my journey and the specific stories which are in the book and the methodology that I use to connect with these students and to bring some joy and some self-accomplishment and self-confidence and some self-defense and teach them how to defend themselves. Yeah, and some yeah, people can't do it, you know, like I said, you know, there's middle of the road and some people may be saying who are listening to this to my interview, to our interview with this podcast right now, maybe saying, oh, well, I can't do this. I can't do that. And, um, you know, that may be true and it may not be true. There is middle of the road and it's, it's, I'm not saying it's for everybody, but it's certainly, certainly because of the not being a team sport and being an individual discipline, there is opportunity for a lot more people on the spectrum mm -hmm. To be able to participate yeah. and to yeah. have some success. Well, I think if 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 anything, like you know, I feel I feel like a lot of what we've talked about can be applied to lots of different kind of situations in life, both both for individuals who are who are sort of listening in, and also perhaps sort of parents of of you know particularly autistic or, or disabled individuals. I think 
you know, I, I would definitely, you know, highlight before we kind of try and wrap things up that, you know, in all of my experiences, both sort of within school and coaching in Taekwondo and sort of working with other sort of kids, there, a lot of, a lot of them were really sort of starved of a lot of encouragement quite often. I think sometimes, you know, in our efforts to kind of protect and make sure that they're okay, we, we sometimes were a bit wary about them trying new things and taking on things that might might be quite difficult for them due to due to sort of the differences of that they have. But I think that's um you know, definitely something that I would I would highlight. And I think this is it's been good. Been good to chat. And would you would you be able to sort of share so the, the name of your book and, and where people can find that. Absolutely. I'd love to. It's called Martial Arts on the Autism Spectrum. It's available on, it's actually available in the UK on Amazon. And uh, Martial Arts on the Autism Spectrum and the full title is Practical Tips from Three De- Decades of Training Kids and Adults. And if you just search Martial Arts on the Autism Spectrum and my name, Al Loren, L O R E N, it'll come up. And if it doesn't come right up, scroll down a little bit and it'll be there. And uh, yeah, it, yeah, it's it's well, my journey, it's my story, and um, it's backed with a lot of um, information. It's a it's a fun read. It's an informative read. Awesome stuff. Well, thank you very much for that. And as usual, the links the link to that will be put down in the description of this podcast or, or the YouTube video that comes out. If you want to go check that out. Thank you very much um, to Al. Just a little update for everybody before we sort of say goodbye. Next episode, we are going to be talking to a very, very lovely lady about cerebral palsy. So sort of their experiences with that. So stay tuned at the moment we I am sort of taking a bit of putting podcast on the back burner a little bit. So you can expect kind of more sort of monthly episodes rather than weekly like it was before. Um, but we're still going with them. And if you want to stay up to date with all the stuff that's going on in my life in terms of like my business and the things that I'm creating, you can always check out the link tree down in the description or type in at Thomas Henley UK on pretty much any social media site, Instagram, Spotify, uh, Instagram, <laughs> not Spotify. <laughs> Instagram, uh, YouTube being like the main places that I would highlight. And of course, make sure to rate the podcast if you are on those streaming services like the video and consider subscribing and becoming a member on my YouTube channel to further support the kind of work that I do. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, Al. And Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thomas. It's been a great pleasure and I'm really happy that we could uh, do the interview here. Likewise, Al, it's been great to hear about your story and your your experience teaching um, autistic and and disabled individuals. And I'm sure that a lot of people have got some really worthwhile information from this. Well, guys, it's been a pleasure and I will see you on another episode of the 40 Audi podcast very, very soon. See you later, guys.